Welcome to History Teaching Tools and Tips, a series that introduces strategies encouraging effective practice and meaningful learning in history and social studies instruction. My name is Alan Guidry, Associate Professor and Program Coordinator of History Education at East Carolina University. This session focuses on explicit literacy instruction and cognitive modeling as a means of enhancing students' comprehension skill sets. We'll talk about the pitfalls we often fall into when teaching students using content readings and we'll provide tips and examples of what effective modeling looks like. I hope you enjoy the session. In the thousands of hours I've spent observing veteran and pre-service teachers in the field over the last 22 years, classroom instruction has often, even overwhelmingly, taken the form of lots of teacher talk followed by lots of student independent work. Even when cooperative learning is used, classroom instruction in history and social studies has taken the form of, as Fred Jones and Positive Discipline would call it, say, 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 do teaching. The alternative of say, see, do teaching is often absent, and the byproduct is often disengaged students who are unable to transfer knowledge and skills from one lesson to the next, or more importantly, from one instance to the next. The gap you see is at the point where learning actually occurs when we model for students how to use a particular strategy, and we often skip the step and move on to independent practice. This has harmful and counterproductive consequences to student learning. In his synthesis of over 500,000 educational research studies related to student achievement, John Hattie identified what he called high-impact strategies. Many of these refute the effectiveness of many popular approaches, but one high-impact element of teaching is cognitive modeling of comprehension skills. In order for a student to derive meaning from a text, they don't magically read something and understand it. He or she must be explicitly taught how to approach and analyze a political cartoon, say, in a civics class, or dissect a primary document in a history class. They must observe someone, a more capable other in Vygotsky's language, demonstrate how to systematically think through a document, break that document down by looking at its component parts and understanding its purpose, and how to use this information to extract meaning um, or subsume or assimilate this to prior understanding. Said more succinctly, teachers must systematically show students how to read and comprehend the document. This systematic modeling of the strategy has a number of benefits, the most important of which they are taught how to regulate and access their own thinking for future use, attacking the transfer issue cited by many teachers. I think the central problem is that we assume others think like us when confronted with, say, a newspaper article, but we have the, to explicitly teach them that process for them to know it, particularly those who do not have the benefit of a great deal of academic capital to draw from outside of our classroom. It makes sense when I talk with teachers about this in a post-conference, but it seems that we forget this in the implementation part of our lesson. Let's take a look at what this might look like in a classroom. What do you think we're really talking about when we talk about History 360? Um, I mean, in a nutshell, we're talking about History 360. We're talking about looking at multiple perspectives, getting a well-rounded idea of what that time period is about, not just looking at one or two pretty played out historically perspectives in terms of other historiographies. We're looking at primary sources and maybe even sometimes other historians' works. Yeah, it's, it, it implies the idea, that, and that's a, that's a really wonderful response, it implies the idea that we have to look at history more than just the accounts that we've been given, that we have to look at sort of the, the outside voices, the voices that haven't been heard. And you said it, not only looking at primary documents, but also looking at secondary sources, right? What that implies then, and so as we begin the investigation, we've already talked about what we think the civil rights movement was about, but as we begin the investigation, one of the things that we want to try to do too is we want to try to fill in the gaps. We want to try to fill in the spaces that are left by the accounts that we've been given. Now, we'll never look at every single perspective, but we want to see if we can fill in those gaps, those spaces in history, by looking at individuals um, that we oftentimes don't think about. So that's where our strategy that we're going to share with you today is this is called spaces. And what this is is a way that we actually begin to look at historical documents and try to find out where this individual fits or where this event fits or where this occurrence fits within the context of, of multiple perspectives of history. Again, this is we would use this with each and every strata or excuse me, each and every document that we would look at, or each and every image, each and every um, text that we're interacting with. And we've talked about text being different things, right? 
Um, so let's take a look at what SPACES is. First of all, it, it is just a little acronym that we came up with to help us remember, and that's one of the things that you know that I like to do, is I like to, to share with you these things that are sort of memorable, um, that help you remember it so that you can use it later on. Because the idea is, is that any time you look at something in history, you're going to utilize this strategy so that you can understand what the document or what that image or whatever it is is trying to tell you. So let's take a look here. Spaces says that first of all, we look at the text and we have a summary of the text. We write a summary looking for its central idea. We identify what the author's purpose is. We analyze the way the text is written and what that might mean. We look at the claims that are made in the text. We look at what evidence is used to support the claims in the text. And we talk about what the author's slant or the author's angle or the author's bias might be. All of these pieces together paint a picture as to why the author is doing what they're doing and why this document might be important for us to look at. So again, it's helping us to sort of fill in the spaces within the history that we're looking at. So to look at spaces, what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at a telegram, a telegram by Jackie Robinson. And we're going to work through this together. And I'm going to model for you and talk to you about what the way that you would go through spaces yourself as you go through these other documents, knowing there are a bunch of others. Um, the first thing that we're going to do, of course, as you know, is we're going to do what with this document? According to our spaces sheet that we have there, what are we doing with this document first? Yeah, we're going to do a summary. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at generally what this is about. So do a quick read of this and tell me. Um, let's go through it real fast. Let's go through it together. Okay? Uh, we'll do a quick read of it together and we'll talk about what the summary is. First of all, we notice the date. We notice that this telegraph is from where or going to where? It's going to the White House. We see that up there at the top. And the date is June 15, 1963, if you can't see it. It's coming from Brooklyn, New York. That's what that would mean. I always want to look at the title, I always want to look at the date because it contextualizes the document. So when I'm looking at it, I want to look at those pieces first, right? This telegraph is sent to whom? The President, the President of the United States. So we look to see who it is to, and obviously the President's in the White House. I'm going to read through part of it, um, and we'll go through it. It might seem fantastic to imagine that even in the state of Mississippi, anyone would seek to do injury to a nonviolent leader like Dr. Martin King as he goes there this morning on a mission of sorrow. Yet it was fantastic but true that some depraved assassin gunned down another man of nonviolence, the late Medgar Evers, whose funeral Dr. King and his associates will be attending today in Jackson. Already do we know what's happening with this, with this document, what's happening within the, within the context of this document? Uh, right now it's addressing a social injustice. It's addressing a social injustice. Is there anything? It's, yeah, it's, it's, it's actually talking about um, going to a funeral, right? And it's, who's going to the funeral in this? In this case, Dr. Martin Yeah, Dr. King's going to the funeral. So, so he's attending this funeral, and it's a funeral of Medgar Evers. So I already, as I'm reading this, I already have a sense that, that he is addressing something. There's a social evil that has occurred. Um, and he's attending this funeral in this tragic event. Maybe we'll get a little bit more out of this, right? Should harm come to Dr. King to add to the misery which decent Americans of both races experience with the murder of Mr. Evers, the restraint of many people all over the nation might, be burst, might burst its bonds and bring about a brutal, bloody holocaust, the like of which this country has not seen. I therefore implore you, in the spirit of your recent magnificent appeal for justice, to utilize every federal facility to protect a man sorely needed for this era. For the millions, Martin King symbolizes the bearing forward of the torch for freedom so savagely wrested from the dying grip of Medgar Evers. America needs and the world cannot afford to lose him the whims, uh, to the whims of murderous maniacs Jackie Robinson and is signed with his, with his initial there. All right? So again, do we want to go back now? Let's revisit it. I've read a little bit. I've got a sense of it to start with, but do I want, to, I want to revisit what this telegraph is about. So have we changed our mind? What is this telegram about now? Um, I mean, on the surface, it's about um, making sure that Dr. King is protected at this funeral, but on a larger sense, it's about protecting Dr. King because he's such a symbol. Yeah, it's, it's protecting Dr. King, right? I, I see that it's, it's about protecting the man. But there is something in here as I read this, and you did a really good job of bringing that out. As I, as I read this, 
I also realize that this is about protecting something bigger than just a man. You said it yourself. It's about protecting a symbol. So when I'm reading, I'm trying to understand not only actually what this is talking about, but what this could be talking about in an even bigger sense. And that's what I got from this. I got the idea that it was about protecting him at this funeral. It was about protecting a symbol. So that might make it easy for us if we look at the next part. Remember, we're going to look at the author's purpose next. As I'm looking at what the author's purpose is, um, what is the author's purpose here? Yeah, and, and I'm not just reading it as a protection. I'm also reading it as what? As I look at this, I'm feeling like Dr. King may not only be saying that we need to protect him, why might I think that, that Dr. King would need protecting? Or why might Jackie Robinson think that? Because without Dr. King, this could turn from a possibly peaceful movement to a military Ooh, What are you talking about? This could get ugly. He says the blood of millions, right? And so what I really think he's talking about, and what I, as I'm reading this, I hear a warning. I'm putting two and two together. We need to protect Dr. King. This bad thing has happened. People are upset. There's been said that something may happen to Dr. King. I am warning the President of the United States, you better put everything you can at your disposal. The purpose of this is to warn the President. And I'm thinking to myself, why might, that, why might there need to be a warning and what would be the reason? What is the difference between Jackie Robinson, a, con a relatively conservative Republican, and John F. Kennedy? What's the major difference between those two individuals? I mean, it's not just political ideology. Political ideology? But the other thing is skin color. That's right. The actual skin color. The, the idea that JFK may not understand what the feelings of the African American community are, or maybe at this point doesn't understand the importance of MLK. So this is a warning, right? Um, as we look at it, we also need to make sure that we look at the text structure. What is, what is the importance of the text structure that this was a telegram that was sent? Why is that important? It's short to the point. It's pretty concise in terms of getting the message across and just even more personal because you're not... It's a direct communication to the president, and in 1963, when this is sent, June the 15th, is there any faster way to get a message to somebody um, than the telegram? There's only one other, and that's phone call, but what's the difference between a phone call and a telegram? It's permanent. There's a written record. I have warned you, I have told you, don't tell me that you didn't know this was coming. It is not, a, a telegram and a, and a phone call are the two most urgent ways. It's not a letter, it's not a note. You said it wasn't through back channels. The, the, the structure of this text, I'm thinking to myself, this signals to me as the reader that it is urgent, that the message has to be there and we want it recorded, right? And so as we look at it, it's concise, it's personal, it's urgent. And in essence, it's forever, right? It is part of the written record. Because if you send a telegram to the White House, it becomes part of the written record. Does that make sense? So as I'm looking at this as a reader, I want to make sure that I bring these, that I understand all of these pieces, that I'm bringing all of those pieces to bear. Because the, every little thing about it sends a message. Okay? Now, what are the claims that are made? That... Okay, there's something that has been wrongful, right? Absolutely, he was depraved assassins. That language to me signals that this is an emotive thing. The other claim, as I'm looking at this, I read this and I begin to see things um, in here that tell me about what the claims are. I want to want to bring this back up here. Look what it says. Should harm come to Dr. King to add to the misery which decent Americans of both races experience in the murder of Mr. Evers, the restraint of many people all over the nation might burst its bonds and bring about a brutal, bloody holocaust, the likes of which this country has not seen. So one of the claims here is that there is, there is trouble on the horizon, right? That there's going to be trouble. Those words I want to pull out, I might even underline that, 
I might highlight that. That tells me, and here's another claim. For to millions, Dr. King symbolizes the bearing forward of the torch of freedom so savagely wrested from the dying grip of Medgar Evers, right? And so he again talks about MLK's symbolism and how important he is. I might, if I'm looking at this document, I may very well highlight that or underline it because those things are speaking to me about what those claims are, what he's trying to say, right? So what evidence is used to support this? What evidence is used to support the claim in this text? The importance of Dr. King, the need to protect Dr. King. Because remember, that's what we're talking about, that this is wrongful, that this, is, that this could cause a problem. What evidence do we have? Well, I'm seeing that he is reporting on the ideas of African Americans, right? He uses that. Um, he uses as an example the, 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 uh, how people are upset already about Medgar Evers, so he talks about those things. I see that sort of language again in here. And then finally, what do you think the author's slant is? And this is an important one for us as we're filling in the spaces. Where are they coming from? What's their, another word might be, what's their perspective? What's the author's slant? Well, if we're looking at the author's Jackie Robinson, it's not from a slant of being um, a conservative or Republican. It's from a slant of being a concerned African American. Okay, all right. So one thing is he is a concerned American because you can't put him in the same box as I would Malcolm X. I can't package him together with a, with a, radical, um, with a radical arm um, of this issue. What I can do, though, is I can understand that Jackie Robinson has certain feelings, that, that he is con he's a concerned American, not just a concerned African American. He's just providing that perspective, right? And we can also say his slant is that he is an African American. The other thing that we can say, and I know this about Jackie Robinson, is that Jackie Robinson is important. You just don't crank off a telegram to the President of the United States and have them keep it. And so he sends it, it gets through to the President, it's stamped, it's understood, and that slant means that Jackie Robinson understands his importance, doesn't it? He knows that he's important enough for the president to read this. See, all these pieces help us understand. And I have to go through, as, I, as I'm thinking through this, I want to make sure that I am thinking about, all right, what is it trying to tell me, right? What is it trying to tell me? What might the author's purpose be? How is this thing organized? What is the author saying? What's the evidence? Because we're, we, know we talk about fake news nowadays all the time. What's the evidence to back this up? And then what might be their slant? What might be their bias? All of those are important to me, and I've got to use those in the way that we just did it. So why don't we take a moment now, and let's take a look at a second telegram that was sent by Jackie Robinson. And you give it a try, and what we'll do is we're going to do it in a think-pair-share. You guys will pair up, and you'll look at it together, and we'll talk about spaces, and I'll circulate, and if there are any questions, I'll answer those for you, okay? As you can see through the video, effective modeling actually requires that some intentional steps be taken. First, as with any teaching, we must activate their prior knowledge related to the structure of the text we use. There are different sorts of texts that we might use in a history or social studies lesson, and students need to be coached on how to use the language of the text to clue them into what type of text they are reading. This helps the students begin to see that different texts are used for different purposes, and must be read accordingly. This activation of prior knowledge can take the form of experiential examples or from examples of recent texts they might have read. We then discuss with the student the organizational pattern of the text. You will find that I always use graphic organizers in conjunction with readings. This is because the use of mental schema around a text helps students to remember not only the content of that text, but also what that text is trying to accomplish. Teaching them how to organize their thoughts around a text pays dividends later as they work to transfer the skill to later examples. Now here is where our modeling comes in. We must now work with them through a sample text. We must read through a sample with the same organizational style. We should engage in a think aloud where we talk about what to look for and verbally process what we are seeing. 
Let's take a look at the video to see this in action. Ever. So I already, as I'm reading this, I already have a sense that, that he is addressing something. There's a social evil that has occurred, um, and he's attending this funeral in this tragic event. I'm gonna, I might even underline that. I might highlight that. That tells me, and here's another claim. Um, well, I'm seeing that he is reporting on the ideas of African Americans, right? As you can see, we can ask questions of them at this point to assure they are with us, but we want it to be very clear what sort of things they should be considering. Here's where we model how they might use context clues, how they might relate material, or where we walk through perhaps what it means for an event or person to be significant. We focus our attention on clearly and overtly defining the processes and expectations and before we set them off on their own. Once we have explicitly shown them how to work through the text in whatever form it might take and using whatever organizational pattern, we can turn them loose knowing we have taught them how to comprehend and not merely assign and circulate. If we invest our time in this practice, we will reap the dividends of transfer of skills later. I hope you've enjoyed this session on explicit literacy instruction and cognitive modeling as a means of enhancing reading comprehension in history and social studies. Be sure to check back with us at History Teaching Tools and Tips for more ideas on how to enhance instruction in your history and social studies classroom. See you next time.